Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about emotional affairs today, how to understand infidelity, why people do it, uh, why people create emotional affairs, why it's so easy for us as human beings to do this. Um, and we'll be taking some of the questions. I'll be going through some of the questions that came in through the Facebook group. She writes, well, I don't know if it's a she, maybe a he. I'm just wondering everyone's thoughts on spouses having relationships or friendships with the opposite sex. How much is too much? Where do you draw the line? How can you keep things from turning into an emotional affair or a sexual affair? How open and honest do you feel your spouse or you need to be with each other if you have close friends that are the opposite sex? Is it possible to not cross lines while having close friendships with the opposite sex? So first of all, I would say that about, you know, 80% of emotional affairs start out as friendships. And this is according to um, Shirley Glass's book called Not Just Friends. And so the primary, one of the ways that Shirley Glass talks about what happens in emotional affairs is that a boundary that has normally been around the couple around the partnership gets drawn around the partner, one of the partners and the affair partner. And so there starts to be a way in which the spouse is being excluded from that friendship. That is, there are secrets. That is the primary definer, right, of infidelity is that you are keeping information from your spouse that you know she or he would want to have. What starts to happen is you are keeping your spouse from information you know they would want to have. And so as soon as, you know, infidelity is not defined by the sexuality of the relationship per se, right? It's not about someone who's taking off their clothing that defines now it's infidelity. It's as soon as you are excluding your partner and creating a boundary with another person. And importantly, you are sharing information that builds connection with another person and reduces it with your spouse. So, you know, a really important define, I remember one person fearing that his wife was having an affair. She had some account that he was unaware of, a bank account. He wanted to see it. And I remember, she, you know, she said, why do you want to see it? Like, why, what is your issue? Why do you distrust me? And he said, I want to see it because you don't want me to see it. <laughs> and that really captures something that there's, if you have no secrets, right? If there's nothing to hide, why are you keeping secrets? And so if you know that you are trying to keep your spouse from being privy to a conversation you're having with a coworker, being keeping them from knowing about a text exchange or an email exchange, this is a very important red flag that you think you have something to hide. So again, if it's just friendship, there's no, uh, say there's, there's nothing there that excludes the partner. Um, importantly, and I think this is a big aspect of it, is that what often happens is the affair partner, there's distortion or objectification that's happening both towards the spouse and the affair partner. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a minute. But one of the reasons that affairs happen in the first place is because intimacy is difficult. We tend to talk about intimacy as if it's a positive thing, as if it's about validation and closeness. But I don't want you to confuse closeness with intimacy. Intimacy is a willingness to know someone and be known by them. And that takes courage. What happens in marriages often is there is some intimacy as one is dating and closeness. You get to have both things, right? You, you get to know the other person. You feel understood by them. You feel a sense of connection and hope. And, and that's really positive. But when people keep growing in a marriage and are trying to share a life together and raise kids together and pay a mortgage together, right? There become these areas of misunderstanding. You aren't feeling close. And what 
if, if you're going to continue to be intimate, you're going to tolerate conflict, something that we tend to not like and we tend to avoid. And so if we're trying to avoid conflict, right, we'll often not share our honest view, not say what we really think, not go in and deal with our partner fairly. And we might know, okay, well, if I talk about this, she's going to get really upset. He can't handle it when I bring up this thing. And so what we often do is then like, because I can't tolerate the invalidation here, and I can't stay in the conflict with my spouse, I'm going to go find someone else. Now people aren't premeditating, but they will intuitively look for someone else who they can feel close to. So again, it's our avoidance of intimacy that often will drive us into closeness with another person because we want the validation of that illicit relationship. And so now people can do this in terms of affairs. People can do it with children. They can do it with family. There's lots of ways to try and find validation at the expense of the partnership. Um, uh, I can't say the same thing. Oh, Murray Bowen talks about this as triangulation, right? That you can go and deal with the tension that's in the marriage by finding another outlet, right? It's your men's group, your women's group. It's whatever you, and you're, you know, you complain about your partnership but it stabilizes the misery there and allows you a, a different kind of intimacy elsewhere and gets you out of, or closeness, I should say, and gets you out of the inherent struggle of intimacy. So in order to justify the deception though, that's inherent to affairs, we usually have to deceive ourselves. So we usually deceive ourselves um, in a kind of, objectification of our partner and of the affair partner. And this is where you take what your spouse's limitations are and you magnify them because you have to find a way. Let me, let me back up. I'm going to say one more thing. I remember Dr. Schnarch saying that most infidelity is driven by contempt, by anger, much more than the drive for sexuality. I don't know if that's the right view or not, but it was, it's one that I've thought about a lot, which is I am angry about the validation I cannot get in this marriage. It makes me resentful that you won't validate the view of myself that I desire. And when we're immature, we do have a demand for that or a desire for that, that uh, interferes with our ability to tolerate and create intimate connection. So a lot of times when you can't get the validation from your partner, you may stay quiet about it. I know a lot of men who do this, they're actually nice guys, conflict avoidant, but they're resent and they maybe go along with what their spouse wants, which accrues to their resentment and their covert entitlement. And so because they feel this can go both ways, of course, women have emotional affairs too, right? But that resentment accrues in a way that justifies the intimate deception. And so she can't handle it. She's always pissed off. She's got all these things she wants me to do. She never understands me. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't appreciate me. And so that justifies the deception. And to keep that deception justified, people usually have to distort their view of themselves, of their marriage partner and of the affair partner. So that is, they will tend to distort that they will focus on the limitations of their spouse, right? You never understand me. You never want to talk about anything. Every time we disagree, it's all about you, whatever you you're finding a way to say you deserve the dishonesty because you are unreasonable. They also will tend to inflate the affair partner, which is relatively easy to do in part because you don't have to actually share a life with that person. Don't have to pay bills with them. You can know them in a very uh, prescribed, is that the right word? Um, you know, very limited um, context. And so you can collude, sorry, my hands are, <laughs> you can collude in limiting how much exposure there is to other aspects of yourself and use that limited relationship 
to keep a mutual validation system going. Now, a lot of people will offer to that relationship things they don't offer to their marriage in order to get the view, the distorted view of themselves that they want to have, right? I'm a great guy, okay? I'm an amazing woman and my spouse doesn't get it, doesn't understand me. And so, um, you know, I, I've worked with people where they started having an affair and they're in an interaction and guess what? Both people have spouses that do not understand them, right? It kind of, kind of makes me chuckle a little bit because it's, it's this idea that they don't get me. They don't love me the way I should, they should, therefore I'm justified in doing this. But really, in my view, it's not that their spouse doesn't understand them. It's that their spouse maybe does understand them does see their selfishness, their self-service, their unwillingness to deal with themselves. And, and so because they don't want to deal honestly with who they are, they go look for someone who will reflect back the view of themselves that they really want to have. And if they're busy reflecting back a positive view to the affair partner, it's a, it's a mutually gratifying validation, even though it's highly limited. So, um, it's easy to do this. It's easy to, um, it might start out as you just are sharing some. So, so first of all, if you're, if you're complaining about your partnership to that person, big red flag. Okay. They don't get me. You do. I don't feel close to that person. I'm glad I can feel close here. Okay. So that's a big red flag. If you start building connections and building commonalities, which is often common, you find things that you're, you're working on a project together, you start doing something together. Um, you're building more of this illusion of closeness and connection, and it can feel very justifiable that what you have with this affair partner, if you only could have married this person, if you only could go back in time, you would surely have something that you don't have with your loser spouse. <laughs> okay. So a very, very easy thing for people to tell themselves, be partly because the relationship hasn't been tested by uh, the light of day, by reality. And because there is a mutual collusion going on in, in you know, you're saying you're the better one than the rotten situation I have at home. So I'll, I'll take up some more of the questions and, and talk about some of these things more. But what is very interesting is that affair relationships fall apart more than 80% of the time. They divorce more than 80% of the time. If someone goes from a marriage into that affair relationship, the illusion that is there that often drives the passion and the desire because there's a lot of illusion, um, that this is often um, can't be sustained by reality. It is a very tempting idea especially when you're in pain. So let me just give me a little bit of compassion here before I take up some of the questions. The intoxication of the validating other is really, really challenging to not succumb to, especially if you're in a high conflict marriage and you feel stuck, or if you feel that you can't get to a better place with your spouse, the allure of someone who is offering a high validation energy can be very, very difficult to say no to. And so I remember having a client who was in a sexless marriage. She couldn't get her husband to deal with his low sexual desire and the impact that it was having. Um, and, you know, she was starting to get energy at work from a guy and she was pleading with her husband, like, please, can we deal with this marriage? Please, will you take, because she wasn't sure if she could withstand the allure of a sexually interested other that would give her the validation, the sexual validation she'd been hungry for for so long in the marriage, but could never seem to get. And this person says, there's an inherently exclusive and confidential relationship between a bishop and his female ward members, and they go to him for counsel about their marriage. It seems hazardous and certainly violates the principle you gave about not keeping secrets. A bishop is required to keep secrets from a spouse. What is your suggestion regarding those relationships? Yeah, well, I would just say it's very um, tempting 
and easy to use a third party as a collusive alliance and one that keeps you from dealing with your marriage. And especially if you have a marriage partner who is either not no longer believing LDS or is looking at pornography or something like that, it can be very easy to then go and get the collusion of the bishop or, you know, another um, friend or parent or whatever, and build a kind of, I understand you, N not that it's going to turn into an affair, but more like you poor thing, uh, you're in this difficult marriage. It, it actually interferes with going and dealing with the marriage. So when a third party is unhelpful, it interferes with dealing with the marriage. When a third party is helpful, they are pushing that person to deal with their marriage. And so these collusive alliances can happen in families very easily with friends. Uh, you, you want to make sure you're not reinforcing someone's victim narrative. Um, you know, I remember when I first started doing this work, I would be like, why do I, why are the people that come into my office always the ones that got the raw end of the deal in the marriage? Okay. Kind of naive of me. It's like sometimes then their marriage partner would come in and I'd be like, okay, wait a minute. Uh, there's a lot more to this story. And, you know, it can be very easy to be seduced into one person's view of how bad they have it because they don't see their own participation. And again, this is what an affair partner will do very well. Like you poor thing, she doesn't understand you and you're so great. Okay, so a lot of times like people who, I'm just gonna focus on men for a moment here because this is often how I see it. If they feel ineffectual in their job, ineffectual in their lives, don't feel that they're getting the validation that they want about who they are from their spouse, sometimes because their spouse is right on the money, sometimes because their spouse is withholding, right? they are married to a limited person, most certainly, that they will go and offer a kind of compassion, kindness, generosity, right? A sort of, uh, I'll take care of you kind of energy to an affair partner that they don't offer at home. And then, you know, draw that person to look at them with, oh, you know, you're so magnanimous, you're so good, you're so kind. So they're, they're, they're like actually cueing the person that they're helping to admire them, to desire them, to respond to them as someone who's strong and so on. And so it can be, they're, they're pulling for the view that they want to have of themselves, which very seldom can we get from our marriage partner. Somebody said, you know, like marriage is like one of those magnifying mirrors, you know, if I make those makeup mirrors, turn on the light and it's magnified times 10 and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, you see things that that's kind of your marriage partner, right? <laughs> and, you know, an affair partner is like those, those, what are those vanity mirrors, the mirrors that make you look skinnier than you are and they're kind of smoky and they're, you know, they make everything look good. So, you know, this is, we don't often want to deal with what's true. We want the view we want to have. And so we go looking for the, someone who's going to give it to us rather than dealing with, um, what's true about ourselves, which is the only way that we're able to step into a truly intimate relationship anywhere. Okay. So this person asked the question, it's been one and a half years since my husband told me about his three month emotional affair after lying to me on two occasions when I asked about what was wrong. My husband ended the affair and we both took the strengthening your relationship, art of loving and art of desire courses to work on reconnecting emotionally and physically. How do I help explain better to my husband that the emotional affair continues to be a break for me during sexual activity together? And what she means by that, I talk about this in the Art of Desire course, that it, that it makes sexual desire go down. So I'm imagining what she's saying is she'll remember the emotional affair while they're it being intimate and then that will make her sexual desire uh, go down or maybe before being intimate. Uh, my husband feels that the emotional affair was not as bad as a sexual affair, but when he says this, I just feel like it's a justification for the emotional affair. How can we communicate this better to each other to promote more healing between the two of us and establish more accelerators and less breaks? 
Prior to the emotional affair, we were both unhappy in our marriage and both felt neglected, rejected, and lonely. We've apologized to each other for our roles in the unhappy times of neglect and lonely rejection prior to the emotional affair. We've been married for multiple decades. Okay. So what I would say about that is that something is unresolved for the wife, and uh, maybe that goes without saying, but I think thinking about what is unresolved for me around the emotional affair. Uh, is it, if I'm struggling to forgive, why? Is there something there that I haven't yet worked out either within myself or between the two of us? Is there something that still needs to be understood? What, what I think is that oftentimes as painful as affairs are, is they are often um, couples that come back from it. I think Shirley Glass says something like, I think it was her that said it, but don't end the relationship for at least three months after finding out about an affair because you want to use that time to sort out how you as a couple are in the position that you're in and what role you each may have in it. And this is not to say that you're never responsible for a spouse's behavior. The spouse always determines how they're going to behave and how they're going to handle themselves in a marriage. But you do well to understand your role in the context of the marriage that you've been in. Uh, not because you're to blame, but to better understand how you can create the marriage you want or who your spouse is and what is the wise thing to do going forward. Are there issues you need to address or is this somebody that it's not wise to stay with? So something's unresolved for the wife. Now, what I would say is that for women, um, there's some research on this, is that for men, often sexual affairs can be more disruptive than an emotional affair uh, with their wife and another man, where for women, emotional affairs can feel worse than, say, like a one-night stand. Now, of course, every woman's different here. Th this person asking this question is really clear that we were both a part of the unhappiness, right? Um, we both created a marriage in which some form of infidelity, I'm imagining, could be possible, but maybe it's worth then still thinking about what is it that you aren't yet resolved about? Because when couples come through infidelity and and grow in the face of it and come back together differently, they have learned about each of their roles. They have done something about each of their parts in that. And um, even if the one who's unfaithful is playing the major part, okay, but they have both come up with a cohesive, a genuine, honest, cohesive understanding of what happened and why they're choosing it again. And so there's something there that's worthy of better understanding. Do I think he still holds on to something special with her? Do I, do I, am I still unresolved about why he was able to lie to me despite all of our difficulties? Am I not certain he's honest now? Is it just pa too painful for me to forgive and that there's a safety in kind of holding on to it? I, I don't know, of course, but looking at what is the thing that I still need resolution around? And does it have to do with just my development or is there something still to be sorted out between us? And that's the question I would be asking. Um, this person asks, what role does flirting play in emotional affairs? My husband has a long history of sharing sexual energy, flirting, with women. He calls it seeking validation, which I find is an effort to take himself off the hook language. He claims he will never take things too far, and I experience his flirting as already a boundary violation to my concept of marriage. I'm hopeful Dr. Jennifer will be explicit in what she believes constitutes an emotional affair. My husband sees his behavior as harmless, fun, and justifies his sexual playfulness with women at work, church, or pretty much anywhere he is, anywhere he is as not an infidelity violation since he doesn't collect phone numbers or pursue more intimate after hours types of relationships with other women. Okay, so... Yeah, I mean, I think that it's 
true that it's not the same as having intimate text conversations, phone numbers, meeting up, doing things together. However, uh, yes, it is a kind of gratification, right, at the expense of the marriage. And it isn't just about being charismatic and uh, enjoying people. There is a sexual energy exchange that's purposeful and the husband seems comfortable enough doing in front of his wife and making her squirm. Um, and he's saying, I don't have the problem, you do, or yes, it's a validation pursuit, but it's not a big deal. But, you know, I think that if it's not a big deal, then why do it? That is okay. It, you know what your wife doesn't like it. It undermines her sense of of you caring about her because it is saying this validation is more important to me than our partnership and our uh, and a sense of a boundary around us. This person says, how would you define flirting or the sharing of sexual energy? Well, I would say, yeah, you're playing with sexual, let me see if I can define it, but you're playing with sexual energy. You're playing with attraction and pulling for that um, in a explicit but perhaps deniable way. So it's not so overt that you, how do I say it? It's like you can kind of deny it, but that is the point of it, is that you're trying to get that exchange of energy. And you know you wouldn't like it if your spouse were doing it and you didn't do it. You know you wouldn't like it that they, you know, that she's going around getting all these men that are fawning over her and so on in front of you when you're saying you don't like it. Okay, so it's it's not just friendly. It's not just social. It's not even just charismatic. It's about flirting and expending energy and doing it when you know your spouse doesn't like it. So, you know, I think it's immature. I think it's normal in the sense that we like sexual validation, but it interferes with a solid boundary around a marriage partnership. And I think it's a big price to pay. Um, touching, whispering, holding long eye contact, teasing compliments, sharing secrets and jokes. Yeah, that's any of that is going to be a lot more than even just, uh, hey, I'll let you see that I think you're attractive. That's one level. But compliments, teasing, seductive energy, even if you don't act on it, is definitely a kind of um, move that one is making and a move that one is making on one's spouse. Okay. Um, okay, this person says, what's your take on grooming behaviors that might lead up to an emotional affair. Grooming behaviors defined as being super supportive, noticing changes in hairstyle, texting happy birthday, basically doing anything that makes you seem uber thoughtful or considerate. I don't know if I'd use the word grooming. I mean, I, grooming tends to be, I, I think I know what the person's saying. Grooming tends to be about co sexual coercion um, and what, a predator is doing to their victim. They are building a sense of, of compliance and guilt in their victim. So the grooming is they're pulling that person into deeper and deeper interaction so that they then believe they're complicit in their own abuse. What I think this person though is saying is seductive behaviors that might lead to an emotional affair, right? And I, it's, um, someone talked about it as like emotional pimping kind of, um, which is that I'm going to give you the view of myself that you will find attractive and desirable. I'm going to be, you know, a guy, a guy at a table may do it with the waitress, right? You know, gosh, you work hard. You know, what, a, it's amazing you do that. You know, does your boyfriend appreciate you? You know, you are so amazing. So they're giving like, oh my gosh, that guy at table three is so nice, you know? So, so they're kind of offering the validation that person wants, but in a kind of um, offering generosity, warmth, kindness, 
and getting reflected back to them. What a good guy you are, right? So that's very typical in emotional infidelity is you bring your best self. You like the way you feel with that person. They validate a part of you your spouse does not validate or that you want to have be true. And so it's an indulgent way to live, even though not unusual at all for human beings to do it. Someone writes this, I'm hoping to find some understanding about emotional affairs. About six months ago, I caught my husband messaging another woman. When I brought this up to him, he agreed to block her on all platforms and didn't message her again. Now, recently, I've discovered that he is messaging another woman. This can only be an emotional affair as she lives in another country, as was the other woman. And then it says edited, this for me has crossed the line because sexual type messages have been exchanged. No pictures or videos to my knowledge. We are struggling financially and he feels stress and disappointment that he can't provide for his family. Is this his way of seeking validation and maybe feeling better about himself? I am sure, but we'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Also, how would I bring this up if I found this out by snooping on his phone? I know I definitely have trust issues of my own I need to work on. I think it's important to think about what do you mean by that, that you have trust issues because it does sound like your husband is not being honest and forthright. Um, so your distrust isn't necessarily a trust issue. It may be well-founded, your distrust. Um, I know I definitely have trust issues I need to work on from being married to him and through talks in the past this isn't something he feels guilty about and nor does he want to change it. Talking to him about deep personal issues is almost impossible as he has problems truly opening up about how he feels or has felt. So I feel like it's something I either have to come to terms with or make the decision to end things, which neither option sounds good to me. And he refuses therapy for himself. So, um, Okay, well, I don't know that, that the next step would be leaving or just being um, coming to terms with it. I think that you know, I, I, when you say you have trust issues and be thinking about why am I snooping? Is it because I feel that there's something going on and he's not willing to be forthright and there's, I have reason to be anxious and I'm trying to, I'm trying to make sense of it, right? Or am I just controlling and, and, I, and I'm trying to micromanage all the time and I would drive anybody into the arms of another woman? I mean, I'm speaking in extremes, but like, what, what exactly are you saying about yourself here? Is it that I'm a part of the problem or do I wish that idea because that's an easier one to deal with than dealing more directly with my marriage relationship? Your husband has a way of not dealing with himself and what I think I'd be asking myself is how might I be a part of his belief or experience that he doesn't need to deal with who he is. For example, you can be more honest without the demand that he explain things to you, right? You don't, he doesn't have to speak back, but you can be more intimate and speak more directly to the relationship. Remember intimacy avoidance right, is about not stepping away from conflict that you don't want to deal with. But if we're willing to be intimate, we're willing to let ourselves be knowable. So it could sound like this. And if somebody wants to play their perception of the husband, certainly feel free to unmute and give me a response here. But you could say, I have been feeling anxious um, for that this is the right story anyway, if this is the right picture. I've been feeling really anxious in a sense that that you're hiding things from me and because of that and not trusting that you would be honest with me if i asked given your tendency to not respond to me when i ask you questions i went and looked at your phone and saw that you are exchanging i can't remember what it was now but sexy texts with someone i know it's been a hard time lately with employment. I'm sure that you don't feel great about yourself. I can imagine that reaching out to another person could feel good, but I 
take real issue with you carrying on like this with somebody else. So you're exposing your mind. You're exposing your view. Now, does anybody want to just take a whack at being the husband? I'm just going to go back and remind myself of what the husband does here before you jump in. It says, no pictures or videos, sexual type messages have been exchanged, messaging another woman. She lives in another country, so very unlikely that there is uh, any physical contact with her. Um, he said he agreed to block the first one, and then she found out that he's messaging another woman. Okay. Um, he's had some struggle in his employment, uh, disappointments. Talking about deep personal issues is quite impossible. He has problems really opening up about how he feels or has felt, right? So this may well be an intimacy avoidant husband who's really uncomfortable with his own feelings and so on, and so goes and looks for validation or closeness and you know has a way of telling himself this is okay and so okay so i have found this it's deeply disappointing to me that you are carrying on with another person what do you have to say hu husband um well sorry i was hoping you wouldn't find out uh, didn't want to hurt your feelings. Yeah, I think that's a convenient idea that you're trying to protect my feelings. I mean, yeah, I, I imagine that you were hoping you could keep doing this without me ever knowing, which is different than you've been concerned about my feelings. Well, I, I do care about your feelings. I, uh, I, uh, I guess, I guess I, uh, just screwed up and I'm sorry. The problem you, with this, you, though, what do you want me to do about it? Well, how can I make things better? Well, what, what's your guess on that? Um, I guess uh, you probably it'd probably make you feel better if I got off of social media and I didn't talk to talk to other women. This is what you said the first time. And you're talking about it as if you're going to you're going to do what's going to make me comfortable. It's kind of the idea that you're a nice guy who's compliant because now his wife doesn't want him to connect with her, which suggests to me that nothing's gonna change. Well, I'd, I'd like things to change and to be closer to you. I, uh, how, how, can, how can we do that? And I, I have a hard time, I guess, uh, getting close to you because I'm afraid of how you respond to the things that I think and say. Well, Okay, that's one of the more honest things I've heard you say, because I think that you don't tend to want to try. You just stay quiet and then go find closeness with other people. Well, I, I guess I stay quiet because I'm afraid that what I say is going to affect our relationship and I don't want to lose you. You don't want to lose me. Don't start hooking up with other women, even for emotional connection. What's so hard about talking to me? Um, I guess, I, I guess I, I feel like you disagree with me a lot. And, uh, and, um, you know, I feel like you, you don't, you don't believe my feelings or you negate them or, um, I, I, I don't know. It's just something, something that's hard for me. It makes me nervous. Well, I feel like if you want to have a grown up relationship with me, then you need to start talking more honestly with me and knowing that I'm not going to agree with things. 
And then I'm going to have feelings about things. That's what a marriage requires. Um, okay. The I'm woman you're what? texting in whatever, you know, country, she doesn't have to live with you. She doesn't have to pay a mortgage with you. She's not dependent upon your, your behaviors don't affect her life. So it feels cheap that you're going to this other person and saying, you know, my, my reactivity is the issue rather than growing up and dealing with a real relationship. Um, so other, other than, other than not talking to other women, what is the first thing you would need me to do to start repairing things? Well, I am really reluctant to make it about what I need you to do. Because as long as it is in the frame that you're taking care of me, it's easy for you to resent it and to keep feeling justified in your secrecy. I mean, the issue is whether or not you're going to deal with yourself and how unfair you have been. So we'll just stop at that so far, but see, this is not necessarily a woman who's making her husband deal with himself. She's at least sharing her mind. She's not pretending that she doesn't see her husband. And she's saying, I want a marriage with you, not where you are splitting off. If I have a role in it, tell me. Now she's also being a little bit wary of, okay, well just tell me what to do and I'll do it which is already what happened once before when he got off of social media, supposedly, but then lo and behold, there he was again. So, you know, she's saying, I'm not going to take the bait to like now dictate again, what you should do because it's just set up that the, the fantasy that we both want that you're, you know, just dying to manage my feelings and, and change things when that doesn't seem to have been the case. And I want, a partner that can deal with the invalidation of an honest marriage. And for her to be honest enough and um, intimate enough, forthright enough to speak directly to her husband. Right. Again, intimacy avoidance is something people do very comfortably. Either don't bring up issues or use judgment, hostility, anger, control, which is also intimacy avoidant. What, what thoughts or, or observations do people have? I'll come back to this question in the chat, but um, what other questions, I'm oh, sorry, observations do people have about the role play or questions about it? Do people only engage in seeking outside validation when unhappy? No. Mm -mm. Nope. Uh, good question. That outside validation can feel great um, and can be very intoxicating. You know, Schnarch used to say an aff affair, the energy and validation of an affair can never compete with a real marriage. <laughs> so that is, you know, it's very, very easy to that engagement especially if you're doing something working on a project at work together when you're doing things together right that validation that approval that connection that shared you know you know people that in the trenches on any project start to build a sense of connection with one another and can be very easy to start having closer relationships with people in the office for example than what you feel at home when you're you know, doing different things in your lives. And so it doesn't have to be a function of impairment. That's for sure. Um, let me go back to this question that came in. It says, this person says, I've been married 20 years to the most amazing man ever and thought we had a nearly perfect marriage. Somehow I still fell into the trap of having an emotional affair with a colleague that I had considered a friend for many years. Romantic feelings and inappropriate conversations took place for three weeks. And once it started to turn physical with some kissing and touching, I came to my senses and severed the relationship. 
my job, any contact with anything related to him and came clean and told my husband everything, as well as church leadership that took place several years ago. My husband has fundamentally changed. My horrific act paired with the loss of a parent last year has left him generally depressed. Yeah, anxious and negative about life. He has gained a lot of weight and has had health problems exacerbated by the weight and stress of it all. I feel incredibly guilty for what I've done to him, my best friend, that has always had my back. I have done everything within my power to wake up to my selfish ways and dissect my sinful betrayal so that I may never repeat it. I joined an unfaithful women's support group, did my own therapy, went through the repentance process, read lots of books on the subject, found an accountability partner, and so on. My question is, one, how do I help him be okay again? He won't do therapy or expose himself to the resources I think are helpful. And as oddly as it sounds, um, I want to not care about my affair partner anymore. But when my husband is so withdrawn and depressed, it's hard not to think about my affair partner sometimes and the attention and joyful energy that relationship once had. How do I let go completely of any positive feelings or concerns? Um, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I think that what often happens, and Esther Perel talks about this, is that a lot of times what happens in marriages is um, that the couple's often collude in a marriage becoming predictable and kind of stilted or stale and that there's not enough growth in that marriage and then somebody kind of falls in to something where they feel alive again they feel a newfound energy they feel that romance and connection and it's not necessarily that something was so bad over in the marriage it's just that they kind of stumbled into that Eros energy that makes them feel alive and so on. And I think if people could understand the impact that that indulgent moment is going to have on the rest of their lives, they wouldn't do it. But it's very easy to deceive oneself and to, you know, imagine there is this secret place in which that relationship can exist and you can get some of that aliveness again. And, um, and so what you're speaking about, the person writing the question is like, you know, it's hard because there have been the costs of my behavior and my husband's difficulty dealing with it and processing his feelings about it that have then made the marriage feel more dead and more uh, full of resentment. And then the, it, I mean, maybe it's for the affair partner themselves, but I think it's probably a lot to do with how you felt in that relationship that you long for. You long for the freedom that you felt, the sense of aliveness, the sense of being desired unequivocally and so on, that I think you're saying you really did feel in the marriage before the infidelity, but it, that the marriage has just struggled to move forward. And my general response, like, so how, how does one deal with infidelity? Well. I would say there's nothing easy about it. And because I can't remember who said this idea, but I remember some theorists talking about the idea that often the place that the marriage is weak, this might be, might be, um, I can't say his name, <laughs> Terry Real maybe said this, that the place where the marriage is actually weak is precisely where it's going to get challenged at a higher level after an affair. And so it can be really, really difficult because how do I deal with the feeling of being, you know, underappreciated, that you actually chose another person, that you were willing to engage with another person? How am I supposed to feel about myself in this marriage and so on? So it's not that couples can't use the crisis. They really, really can. And a lot of couples do. Esther Perel has some research on this, that couples can either you know, stay together but resent, or that they can use the crisis to learn something about who they are, their immaturities, their design, their difficulty dealing with conflict or intimacy or partnership, and use that moment of poor judgment, even if it's understandable on some level, to grow into a better person, to grow out of their narcissism, to grow out of their um entitlement to grow out of their illusions around what 
life and relationships can offer and grow into something wiser. It sounds like that the husband in this situation, it was such a blow to his sense of security and maybe a loyalty that was easier for him to give initially, but he's really struggled to hold on to his sense of self. And maybe what he actually needs is maybe what you both need is to better understand and he doesn't want to do it. It sounds like, but how you both participated um, in the less mature marriage and what it would be to step into a more mature marriage. I think in some ways, like, I think I do appreciate that you wife are saying I have really repented of my meaning I, has meant a, a lot to me to deal with my terrible behavior. I feel really bad about it and I've really wanted to address it and overcome it, which I think is good, but I think it can also almost get into the position of like, you want to be careful that it doesn't just, I don't know how to explain this, but just reinforce that husband is victim, wife is perpetrator in this particular story and not allow something more uh, a mutual understanding to evolve and for something more grown up to take place rather than just I was bad and are you going to ever forgive me? Can we both see ourselves more clearly and grow into something more uh, mature, more loving, more intimate? Um, again, I'm not saying that, you know, it's always the, the spouse is always part of the reason for the affair, um, but usually there is immaturity in the marriage that an affair exposes and it can be utilized to grow up if people will. Okay, it says, I want a partner that can deal with the invalidation of an honest marriage. Tell me more, an honest marriage naturally invalidating? Yes, they are. Do marriages that can handle invalidation tend to have less infidelity? Definitely, absolutely they do. Because there is this idea that, you know, if you're a good partner, you're gonna be the vanity mirror and you're gonna make me look and feel good and you loser, you've got the magnification setting on, <laughs> okay? And you know, sometimes spouses are saying mean things because they've got their own agenda. They're not just reflecting back what's honest or true, but if you're gonna be in an honest marriage, well, there's gonna be invalidation. There's things that you don't know about yourself that are going to be revealed through your spouse's eyes. There's plenty that I see about myself through my spouse's eyes that I didn't see before. Things about my family, things about me and my family, things, you know, that seeing myself through his eyes is like, ooh, okay, yeah, 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 no, you're right, you're right, okay. <laughs> now, it takes some willingness to look honestly at yourself and it doesn't feel good, especially if you have in your idea, in your mind, the idea, if you're loving, you will mask all that from me. You'll pretend it's not there. And so a, 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 a marriage that's truly a friendship and that is not intimacy avoidant will tolerate the puncture to the ego that an intimate marriage demands. And so it's how tightly we hang on to ego that is really the measure of openness in a marriage, right? We, lot, we want closeness rather than intimacy. We want validation more than we want honesty. And so we have to, oh, we're at time already. Uh, and so we have to really look at our intimacy tolerance. A lot of people would, you know, you loser spouse, you were unfaithful. Uh, we're, I'm just gonna get on my moral high ground and that we're gonna agree to the idea that you suck, okay? Well, that's still intimacy avoidant, okay? The woman in the role play is saying, well, talk to me. What do you mean I'm hard to talk to? How? How, is that true, right? Or is he just saying this to get away from himself because you don't validate everything I think, you're hard to talk to? Or am I judgmental or difficult or anxious or I get depressed easily or whatever it is? What do you mean by that? Like I'm willing to look at myself and my impact on you while not losing track of who you are and your impact on me. That's an intimate marriage. Okay, yeah, I think, so I'm saying, I would think the husband, the husband in the role play, I think, might try to put blame back on the spouse. Well, you never have time for sex. Sex is usually quick, vanilla, boring. You don't compliment me. Yes, I, that's, that's another version of a husband that could certainly do that, right? I wouldn't be reaching out to you know, this person if you loved me properly. Now, there may be 
some truth in it. I don't mean to say that, well, what I mean is it doesn't justify the behavior, but it might be a part of the context that has fueled resentment and made it easy to justify going elsewhere for the validation. So sometimes crises in relationship drive more honesty and drive the couple into dealing with themselves. Okay, thanks everybody, and I will talk to you next month. Bye.